Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato. Arahato Sama Sambudasa Putang Damang Sangang Namasami Hello and welcome. For you this will be Pavarana Day. The Lunar Observance Day of October, the full moon, Upasita, the Buddhist holy day, here in Sri Lanka called the Poya Day, and a national holiday. The significance of this particular Upasita is it represents the end of the three-month rains retreat or vasa vasa being pali for rain somewhat similar i think to the sri lankan word vasaya for rain possibly the monsoon season three-month period of the full moon of July to the full moon of October is observed by monks and nuns around the world so it doesn't necessarily their geography doesn't necessarily always correspond with the local weather conditions but that's what it's called now on this day Pararana bhikkhus bhikkhunis nuns go before the Sangha to seek forgiveness for their maybe wrongdoings of body, speech and mind during their stay within that Sangha for this three-month period. If one has been staying alone, as I have, that isn't the case, whereby it's also not the case that we need to have the for following Buddhist festival of Katina, where many uh, lay followers come to the temples offering robes specifically katina is a robes a cloth offering ceremony and all sorts of other requisites for the uh, uh, sangha uh, this is a well-known festival throughout buddhist countries and also celebrated in non-buddhist countries in buddhist communities now i won't be having such a festival i'll get invited to the local ones here but I tend to avoid a lot of these particular um, festivities as it's not really my practice and I'm not living within those particular communities and uh, they're, they're, they're for their own uh, privileges and enjoyment. So I'll continue with my practice as I have been doing, doing throughout the year. Now, this also represents being the full moon of October. When I arrived here in Sri Lanka a year ago, one year ago, lunar calendar wise, it's a little less than that. That year is just coming up. Uh, so I've been here for a whole year and enjoyed the support and encouragement of local lay Buddhists here by way mainly of my interaction daily going on Pindapata into the village and then on into the town to collect my daily offerings of food uh, that which has sustained my existence my practice here we don't use money as monks um, there are some uh, expenses that occur we're living abroad I'm obviously from the UK in England living in a foreign country so there are some uh, expenses that arise from time to time and those are met by your very kind donations that I receive here online 
which are received gratefully here online, but are dealt with uh, without me having to handle money itself, because we are prohibited under the tenth precept from doing that. But I need very little. It's a simple life, and this is the practice of the bhikkhu, of the bhikkhuni, of monks and nuns. We have renounced worldly life to go and either live in a community with other monks and nuns, or alone in solitude. And this can be in the form of uh, a cave under a tree in the open air or an empty building. So there are five places we can live, the monastery in a community, or alone in a cave under a tree in the open air or in an empty building. Now I've been very uh, uh, kindly provided with this empty building, which has been uh, done up a little bit. They would like to have done it up a lot more, but I asked that it was just kept as basic as it can possibly be, just to meet my bare necessities of life, as the song goes. Um, so a little washroom, which is just a tap and uh, a hole in the floor for the obvious, uh, and a bucket for my laundry is sufficient. Now, this isn't to uh, practice particularly harshly, that's sufficient in this climate, um, but to keep things as simple as possible for our daily living and our activities. Now, of course, when we're living in the West or in society, in worldly life, in cities and in towns, we often have a lot more uh, to hand to make our life as comfortable as possible. And there's nothing wrong with this, of course. In fact, this is rather good if you're practicing Buddhism and if you're coming to Buddhism as a new practitioner, learning meditation, that you can live in a supportive environment that might not seem so at first, but if you can find a corner of your apartment or wherever you may live to sit quietly and practice meditation, then that is probably as conducive to the practice as anywhere else you might find in a monastery, which is often a very busy place, full of activity, not only the Sangha, but many people, lay people, coming and going, and ceremonial activities continually going on. Or in solitude, even in the forest, in the cave, under a tree, in the open air, or in an empty building, there are to be disturbances around. We can use, however, whatever those are, as part and form a part of our meditation. At the moment, I'm not sure if you can hear also, but there's sweeping. I can hear sweeping going on around, which is a job that needs to be done to keep the, the paths, the tracks in this uh, wooded area clear um, of leaves. and. Uh, uh, no sooner you've carried out the task, it, it needs doing again. But this is the nature of existence, a nature, impermanence. Uh, it's the nature of unsatisfactoriness, or dukkha, the word, that we come to understand through this practice. And uh, anatta, that things are out of our control. It's translated usually as not self, but it can also make uh, reference to the fact that all things all conditioned things, as well as being impermanent and unsatisfactory, are out of our control, including the physical body and the thinking brain. These being out of our control leads us to the understanding of not-self. We have a heart that's continually beating and lungs that repetitively inhale and exhale. This is essential to keeping us alive but we don't have to think about it. We don't have to, and we are not able to control it. The action of breathing is a very useful and wonderful meditation object the Buddha himself teaches us in the suttas, in the Anapanasati Sutta. Now, interestingly enough, in the suttas, I refer to often in general, rather than specific suttas, I'm not a Pali scholar uh, or a, 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 
a, a student of books of any kind. I've never particularly been interested in that form of study, but more practice, both in my lay life and in this new, relatively new, monastic life. Um, so I've always found to get out and try something, to do something for yourself, and also to bring what that activity is down to its basics, its lowest common denominators, to really get to the insides of how, the mechanics of how everything works, was the way I learned more easily. And this is actually in tandem with the way the Buddha taught both monastics, monks and nuns, and lay people in the suttas, suggesting and asking them to go and try for themselves, experience for themselves through the practice, the realization of the Dharma. Firstly, the Dharma as in the teachings of the Buddha is how we interpret the word Dharma, the word of the Buddha as seen in the suttas, the Vinaya Pitaka, uh, the uh, rules and regulations or guidelines for the way monks and nuns live, the Sutta Pitaka, the words of the Buddha, containing 184,000 no, 84, suttas, um, teachings of the Buddha, uh, and some others, other lay people and other monks also, but the highest, the, the majority of the teachings are directly from the Buddha, and then the Ab Abhidharma, uh, commentaries written somewhat later, analyzing those teachers and giving a little bit more insight into the technical side of the way the mind operates. But the core of our practice comes from the Sutta Pitaka, the suttas. And in that Anapanasati Sutta, the Buddha teaches us meditation. And interestingly enough, throughout the rest of the suttas, not much attention is given to the technique of meditation itself. Now you'd think, being as it forms a major part of the practice, it would be something the Buddha was talking about very often, giving guided meditations and so on. But no, because at the time and in this era he was speaking, many people were already accustomed to meditation, as he was himself before he became awakened and therefore was referred to as the awakened one. In Pali that word is Buddha. This is how we come to refer to the Buddha as the Buddha. So, at his awakening, he realized that what he discovered was the characteristics of existence, but also a place where one could be free from that impermanence, suffering, and self, or not-self, as it comes to be understood through his deep attainments of samadhi, leading to jhanas, deep levels of absorption, these are, in meditation, whereby you are secluded from the hindrances uh, obstructing us towards getting into those deeply absorbed states of meditation, being sensual desire, aversion, laziness, restlessness and worry, and doubt. So, complete seclusion from those to free yourself from suffering in samsara, albeit temporarily, in a state of absorption in jhana. The Buddha had discovered similar states of being, states of mind, of tranquility, peace, we call pasadi, and an overall term we hear, samatha, a tranquil and peaceful state of mind as opposed to samadhi, which is the deeply absorbed levels of focus that enable us to attain to samatha. And also vipassana, which is another word often prescribed as being a form of meditation, but is more a quality, a means to see clearly those characteristics of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta. But really, the only real reference to the practice in detail of meditation is within this Anapanasati Sutta. Anapanasati Sutta meaning uh, mindfulness of the breath. And given this is the only or main reference to meditation the Buddha taught, it has become very significant. And 
for myself is very significant in that it is the practice of meditation I have chosen to be most appropriate for my own practice, but also to teach or demonstrate or show by example others when they inquire about meditation. So I don't talk about the other meditation objects particularly that one can use. The Buddha describes 40 meditation objects particularly, but the meditation object of the breath is so much more available to us all of the time. So amongst those 40s are block colors, so 10 colors, for instance, make up four, 10 of those uh, 40 meditation objects. And, you know, this color has to be either imagined or seen as a block disc uh, in front of you with the eyes open, focused upon, or even just imagined, but focused upon as a meditation object. Now, as a task in hand, I actually consider it much easier to use what we have readily available to us and also something that is not particularly within our control and that is the breath. So resisting the uh, inclination to try and control the breath, we simply observe the breath as we breathe in and as we breathe out. And this is all we need to do, observing the whole body of breath. When I say that, the body of air we inhale and the body of air we exhale is one amount of air inhaled and the exhalation is of the same volume, an amount of air that we exhale its qualities having changed. Of course, our bodies have removed what's necessary, oxygen, and exchange that for what we're exhaling by way of carbon dioxide. But we can visibly notice, or we can feel by touch through our exhalation, if we're observing the breath, maybe at the tip of our nose, but that isn't entirely necessary. But just the sheer knowing of the breath as we exhale, its temperature, as we inhale, may be warm or it may be cool, but noticeable. As we exhale, we'll have reached the level of the temperature of that of our bodies, so unnoticeable. Being unnoticeable, but aware you are exhaling, without controlling, knowing the pace of the breath, the depth. Is it deep? Is it shallow? Is it long? Is it short? Is it warm? Is it cool? all of these attributes of that body of air, inhaled and exhaled. This is all Anapanasati requires of us. And the Buddha recognized this as something he had been practicing as a child, just sitting under the apple blossom tree, enjoying a peaceful afternoon, watching some events his father was involved in. Now, a tranquil and enjoyable environment where he attained to some levels of jhana without practicing anything in particular or doing anything to achieve any direction or goal. Just relaxing and then enjoying the results of that relaxation. Now to do this we just need to allow our bodies to relax, giving them a little time. Allow our bodies, our minds, to uh, to settle and therefore be able to become calm, peaceful and tranquil, experiencing pasadi, experiencing samatha, these Pali words for peace and tranquility. It's just allowing nature to be rather than trying with effort to push ourselves into achieving results of a phenomenal variety, phenomena. So it isn't so much a yogic practice which was more common in the time of the Buddha, of maybe we hear of today, yogic practices of say controlled breathing, of controlled posture, of physical activity, to achieve level, uh, degrees of uh, calmness and relaxation, but of a physically recognizable type of physical pleasure 
and mental joy induced by activity rather than that which the Buddha Buddha's conclusion arrived at which was levels of joy mental joy and physical rapture that could be arrived at with inactivity now this doesn't preclude the necessity for effort in the Noble Eightfold Path we have right view which is representing the idea of what I spoke of earlier, anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and not-self as well as karma and as well as rebirth we have right intention which is the basis of all of our actions of body, speech and mind those for which at this time we might be asking our neighbours, our people we live with, the nearby community or in my case, your, your my supporters and the people I have daily interaction with asking forgiveness of such in either a formal or an informal way like this for anything I might have said through my actions of body, speech and mind that may have come across as offensive or inappropriate or harmed you in any way this is asking forgiveness and it is our intention to not cause harm to not make an impression other than a positive one on our surroundings and keep our environment uh, hold it dearly looking after our surroundings whether we're living in city life or like this in a situation on the edge of the forest here or on the coast in a simple environment we still try to make as little impression or mark on nature as possible intention right speech how we speak how we uh, come across to other people kindly um, but with the view of speech being useful and of course the avoidance of lies uh, right actions all of those actions of body speech and mind I've just mentioned and then right livelihood our daily activities we need to keep our lives sustained the way we sustain our existence after all we're physical bodies and we need to fuel those physical bodies for the next 24 hours or until the next meal time as lay people can and this is done by earning money going out and getting a living and the Buddha has prescribed ways that are defined in the Noble Eightfold Path but are recommended and defined as right livelihood followed by then comes right effort now this is where we attribute our efforts and our energy our determination uh, the Pali word being for which is atitana, determination towards our practice of firstly keeping sila, moral virtue which is a large part of the aforementioned parts of the Noble Eightfold Path I've just referred to are all relating to moral virtue uh, then samadhi, meditation uh, is uh, categorizes the right effort, right mindfulness and right meditation or that is right samasati, samasamadhi the next part of the Noble Eightfold Path right wisdom, uh, so we have sila moral virtue, samadhi meditation, panya wisdom panya is contained within or categorized under or covers really just right view that of uh, knowing the category characteristics of existence about karma and uh, about uh, rebirth and the Four Noble Truths and the following of the Noble Eightfold Path this is wisdom, panya but sila, moral virtue we've discussed at uh, some length but meditation and right effort in connection with meditation is that of determination so it doesn't have to be a strenuous effort of performing all kinds of tantric exercises or kundalini breathing or uh, yogic uh, postures, you know, getting in, twisting one's bodies into knots uh, to torture ourselves into some kind of ecstasy or even transcendent 
rapture and joy, but to just put a determination and an effort to remain still for a period of time to allow that time for our bodies to settle and naturally become relaxed without controlling any aspect of that. And similarly with our minds to naturally with time settle, become calm, peaceful and tranquil. Now this isn't instantaneous, this takes practice, repetitive exercises in this process. So this is right effort. The final parts of the Noble Eightfold Path are right mindfulness and right meditation. We develop throughout all of our daily activities mindfulness. Being careful, in other words, it's nothing particularly comfortable, uh, complicated, but being observant of all we're doing with our bodies and also observant of the way we're thinking, seeing how our thoughts arise and what actions may result as a th uh, that what actions may result through those thoughts arising. So the thought of oh thirst might just arrive and arise and so quickly you've gone to the fridge to get some cold soda or something like that or you've put the kettle on to make some coffee without even thinking. Whereas mindfully you can think that I'm thirsty and you maybe just sip some water. Or conversely, you may just habitually be drinking water like this all of the time when you're not really actually thirsty. But when we're mindfully observing all of our activities of body, speech and mind, that is what we're thinking and how that's relating to our corresponding physical actions, then this is right mindfulness. And this is developed through meditation. And when we come to meditate, we find ourselves sitting like this on the floor, maybe in half lotus position, and just f spend some time. I'm going to not give you a guided meditation here, but just talk us through quickly how we get the opportunity each day to do this. It may be you need to sit in a chair with just your knees at right angles to your shin, so your feet are straight in front of you and sitting firmly on the floor. But don't be leaning on a back, preferably sit on a stool, um, and don't be leaning on arms, preferably have a chair that is armless, so that you're just sitting with your back holding you up. If your back isn't exactly straight, it's okay, but maintain your head's level by keeping your spine straight. And we determine this by just trying, if it's possible for us physically, to have our ears in line with our shoulders, our shoulders in line with our elbows, and our elbows in line with our hips. If, our sitting, if we're sitting on a chair, our knees are then in line straight with our ankles, then everything is all in a straight line. Like if you've seen beads on a string, if it's just hanging and supported by gravity, then they're in a straight line. So we can envisage the top of our crown of our head having a hook, a sky hook, suspending it from the ceiling, pulling, stretching our spine up. And this is a very good exercise to employ as you begin your meditation, to stretch your spine up like this. You see, as I do that, my chin tucks slightly in. Maybe I need to turn around for this. You, and this is because you're pushing your lower spine in towards your belly, your front, your tummy, um, arching it inwards, concave, rather than being hunched over, convex, like that. Pushing it in. Now this, just doing this gives you a burst of energy that you can feel and notice of awakeness. And this begins your meditation energetically, so there's less tendency to drift into lethargy, laziness, sleep, the third of the five hindrances. Remember, there's sensual desire, aversion or not liking, laziness or they call it sloth and torpor, old-fashioned English words, but just laziness will do. 
So that third of the hindrances can make us just doze off in meditation. But if we start off energetically, it will continue more in that vein. Because you've spent some time at the beginning of your meditation establishing your posture. Now I am sitting in the half lotus, which means my right foot is on my left thigh, but you can just have that shin on the ground at the front. Your knees might at first be up a little bit like this, but that's okay. Eventually, as your hips relax with practice, repeating that it's not instantaneous. All of this takes practice. I couldn't sit like this when I first tried, but eventually I had to. So with a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, suffering, I force myself to be able to sit like this in a relatively short period of time. But you can take all of the time at home, in your apartment, sitting in the corner of the sitting room, away from the TV, away from the uh, comfortable sofa, maybe just facing the wall so you're not looking at anything, or a room you've set aside for such, and just sit on the floor. There's not really anything necessary other than that and yourself to sit there. You've got a cushion, it's called your bottom. Just use that, it's fine. Maybe you want another cushion of support underneath that, I don't know. But I mean, I've managed at my age, I'm 57, started meditating at the age of 40. And where I went, cushions were not really an option. They weren't allowed. If you had one, it would soon be wet and soggy. In this humid atmosphere, they don't, they're not that practical. Um, anyway, you don't need to get too fussed about the detail as long as your spine is all nice and straight and your arms and are just hanging there. So imagine the sky hook pulling your spine up and your arms hanging from their shoulders, relax just like that. And then just put your left hand in your lap and your right hand on top of that with just your thumbs touching. And this is where we begin. If you need then after even for a few minutes, five minutes or so, uh, but it'll probably be less than that, usually a minute to two minutes. As you sit and you remain still, with your eyes just gently closed, and you begin to watch the breath, you'll notice some level of discomfort in your body somewhere. And you might wish to make just some small adjustment to alter how you're sitting, your posture slightly. In my case, if I don't slightly lean my head forward, it's hardly noticeable, but just that much, I have a very serious pain in my, uh, to, the, to the left of my right shoulder blade, um, or between my spine and my shoulder blade, which I suffered from from years until, until a uh, physiotherapist identified the cause, which is a pinched nerve in my neck, and he said, just relieve it slightly and problem solved. So I was fortunate through uh, many hours of meditation and the assistance of that physiotherapist's observational skills to pick that up and then relieve that problem. So when you do have problems, which are maybe as a result from injury, don't ignore them and suffer, identify them and act accordingly, make necessarily adjustments, however slight they may be. And remember, that's how you meditate. But then adopt that as your posture from, the, for the, the, from there on after, because it is not about moving around, it is about remaining as still as possible. Because the moment you move, you will not be in an absorbed state of samadhi, because you're moving, you're doing something. You've brought yourself back into the body. But we begin there by coming into the body. And this is where Anapanasati comes into its own. Because where is it? Well, it's in the body. Without any doubt, you're breathing air into your body and you're exhaling it from your body with a bodily action. Now, when is it? Well, the first thing we want to do when we sit to practice our meditation is to assist our mind's clearing process, settling process, by making a determination. This is where right effort comes into place again, an aditana, to leave all thoughts of what's happened prior to this sitting, so the past, 
right there in the past. In fact, there's no point going there by way of any investigation into the past because what's happened is done and cannot be changed. So leave it right there, put it down. Like arriving home with your shopping or your work baggages, you get home, get to the front door, come inside and you drop everything down. This is where at the beginning of the meditation you drop all of the baggages of the past. And similarly with the future, which hasn't happened yet and may not happen, you drop this with those baggages and make the determination, so right effort, to, for this time only, until the bell rings or the alarm rings, whatever you've set to remind you at the end of the meditation to now finish, then you will leave the past and the future outside of the, your thinking. If your mind drifts there, know that you've just gone into the past and come back to what is here and now. And what is here and now? I said, when is it? The breath. When is it happening? Now. When we're contemplating death, marana nusati, marana nusati is contemplation of the death in Pali, uh, which monks do as often as they possibly can, as should lay people, lay Buddhist practitioners, as often as they possibly can, contemplate the inevitability of aging, sickness and death, because they are the things we are sure of. We might not know what will happen in the future, that is just imagination and expectation. An expectation only brings about disappointment and additional suffering. So don't imagine and don't expect and then you remove that whole level layer of suffering. But know what is here and now. This breath in, is it long, is it short? This breath out, is it deep, is it shallow, is it warm, is it cool? Without over-analysis, just being aware of the process of breathing in and breathing out, is your body bringing your conscious awareness, your attention into the body, and very clearly into the present moment, here and now. And also very clearly allowing you to see, so vipassana, the nature of impermanence. As you breathe in, it isn't long with these conditioned bodies of ours that you have to breathe out. And then breathe in again. You can even notice between breathing in and breathing out, inhalation and exhalation, the pause between. This is a moment in the present moment, here and now, not in the past, not memories, not in the future, not imagination, but right here, right now, in the present moment. And by which time your body has had time to really settle. If you've maintained this posture, you're still aware of keeping your spine straight, you notice your chin in a little, as you're suspended from the ceiling by this sky hook, lots of energy there, you'll feel your body beginning to just naturally relax. And with this comes about a peaceful and calm state of mind, resulting in a degree of pleasure, a degree of joy, happiness. Not a lustful craving. Not quite that of quenching a thirst but a simple, relaxed, floating form of joy. And, ah, isn't that nice? As you arrive, you get home, you sit down on the sofa after a hard day, put your feet up, ah, isn't that nice? This kind of joy, this kind of physical rapture. 
And this is really moving towards the first jhana. And it can be with practice and with experience that quick from simply sitting in your accustomed posture, maintaining this energy and awakeness, remaining still, bringing your attention into the present moment here and now, using that valuable tool of the breath. Now in the Buddha's time, many people were already meditating. He came from a background of meditation, having attained all kinds of meditative states of jhana and the yoga practices of different forms of deeply absorbed samadhi and focus. There are even some phenomena that can arise in meditation that are outside our conceptual understanding, magical, ethereal, mystical. But isn't this we're looking for? What the Buddha recognized sitting under the apple blossom tree was the simplicity of this natural behavioral tendency of ours to just settle and relax without tiredness, but energetically so, enjoying the peace and calm of mind and physical rapture, overall joy of being in a simplistic and natural way. So he taught this through the Anapanasati Sutta on the understanding that people were already practicing many forms of meditation, but as an alternative and a way of showing people that it, effort can be simply in the not doing rather than the doing of, in the just determination of to stay still, to be inactive, rather than a determination to be proactive in an activity resulting in the use of energy rather than the development of restorative energy that is brought about through this practice of Anapanasati meditation. So I hope what I've given you there really wasn't planned, as things never really are around here, but a brief guide, not a guided meditation, but a great brief guide as to the steps we need to go through to be able to meditate. So we keep the moral precepts, five precepts, no killing, stealing, sexual, uh, sexual misconduct, lying or taking of intoxicants, very importantly. This is the grounding and the foundation of our meditation practice, which is why on these upositors, the monks and nuns, they get, well, separately, the monks get together and the nuns get together to recite their 227, in the case of monks, or in the case of nuns, 311 patimokha, rules. Patimokha is the way to freedom. So it's not rules that constrain us within a cage or walls, but rules or guidelines to a way of living that free us to experience these wondrous states of being, free from suffering within this lifetime. Like I mentioned earlier, in a state of jhana, in a state of samadhi, you can experience a glimpse of freedom from suffering, seclusion from the hindrances, the, object, the, 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 ob the obstacles in the way of meditation, and in the way of gaining a lot of our materialistic goals in everyday life. The same ob obstacles can be applied. But when seen clearly as just simply sensual desire, aversion, laziness or lack of effort, restlessness and worry, so thinking about the past and the future rather than the present moment, and doubt, not fully understanding the Four Noble Truths, or following as a result of that the Noble Eightfold Path, then you will not achieve either your materialistic goals or, within meditation, freedom from suffering, or a glimpse of freedom from suffering. So this is why it's such an important foundation to the practice. Just simply that. Keep five precepts, that's all. No killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, or taking intoxicants. Then you can just sit in the corner of your room, or under a tree, or in the open air, or in a cave, or in a monastery wherever you may be, 
whatever noises are going on around you and just know this present moment here and now and to assist with that to bring you into this present moment here and now and with that clarity of knowing start breathing you're already breathing but bring your attention your conscious awareness to just that the breath as you breathe in and as you breathe out it's really nothing more complicated than that now you can go through the the, the 16 stages the tetrads you can go into the Abhidharma and look into the depths and the scientific values of every moment and thought that we may have. But is it really necessary when you can just experience the bliss and joy, both physical and mental, within this present moment here and now, so very quickly, by doing so very little, without study, without revision, but with, yes, just a little practice. Without overdoing it, just regularly, each and every day, each morning, practicing meditation for a little while, and each evening, practicing meditation for a little while. Now, I hope you can please join me every day, if you have the opportunity, not necessarily live, although it's live Sri Lanka time, which is the same as India standard time at 6 a.m., I meditate then just for 15 minutes, that's all. Prior to that, I've meditated usually for about three hours. But at 6 a.m., I do a short chanting, six or seven minutes, that's all, just to allow myself and people to physically get comfortable and settle. And also remind us of the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And a reflection, but in the Pali language you can look at the English translation in the chanting book. Then a 15 minute meditation followed by some short blessings to wish you well, both physically and mentally, and happily go about your day. Now those, although they're alive at 6 a.m. Sri Lanka or Indian Standard Time, are available at any time. So at six o'clock in the morning or at six o'clock in the evening, put that little video on. It's very short, less than 30 minutes, but it sandwiches 15 minutes, which if you're not meditating already, you can take that 15 minutes as a timer, as a moment, with all the distractions that may be going on around me, of flies and mosquitoes, cats jumping on me, noises in the background, comings and going, still able at 15 minutes, for 15 minutes to enjoy uh, absorbed states of samadhi that you can accompany me with each and every day they're all there available on YouTube and if you want to meditate for longer ignore that and that's great just set a timer for 20 minutes or half an hour and just follow those tips it doesn't need to be complicated establish yourself a good posture keep a straight spine and the rest will just happen. There's nothing for you to do. Thoughts will arise. Let them arise. Don't try and control anything. Eventually you'll come back to just watching the breath. And if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again, is what my grandmother used to tell me. Dear Nana, her sayings have become more and more relevant <laughs> as I've gone through life. At the time, they weren't so relevant, but uh, they come to be as time goes by. So on that uh, note, I should uh, leave it there. And hopefully there's something useful. If there is, please use it, share it. And if not, just let it go. Until next time, be happy and stay well. Suki Hotu.